So erythritol is a really common sweetener in a lot of, you know, processed products as well as sweetener packets. And there's been some recent news, some recent headlines saying erythritol might increase your risk of heart attacks and heart problems, you know, cardiovascular problems. And so, of course, a lot of people are like, oh, no, I need to throw out all my erythritol and never eat it again basically. Um, but what's actually going on with this research? What do they actually do? How reliable is it? And ultimately, the, the, the big question in your mind is, should you stop consuming erythritol? What are the kind of the risks and the benefits of doing that versus continuing to use it? So that's what I'm going to break down in this video. And I'll go through the research and I'll go through also some kind of big picture things to, to think about when you're looking at research like this. So what did they actually do in this uh, research that they're citing in these various news reports? Well, the interesting thing is what they didn't do. What they didn't do was they didn't give erythritol to people and then see if they had an increased risk of heart attacks. Nope, not even close. What they did do was they just looked at some data of like, okay, here's some people that had like heart attacks or strokes or whatever, cardiovascular problems. Um, and let's check their blood for a bunch of different things and see if certain things are high and maybe those high things will tell us something. And they found that these people that are having these heart problems and stuff had high levels of erythritol in their blood. Isn't that interesting? Well, here's the little known fact. And even though I've taken a bunch of biochemistry classes over the years, I didn't even remember this because it doesn't come up very often in, you know, in anything really, um, but it came up now. And the, the little known fact is that your body actually makes erythritol through this pathway, this, you know, met, met, part of your metabolism, you know, metabolic pathway called the pentose phosphate pathway. Um, so like most things, it probably happens in your liver, maybe other places. But, but uh, so this pentose phosphate pathway revs up when there's a lot of glucose around. What's glucose? Sugar. How do you get a lot of glucose in your body? Eat lots of sugar and carbs. So guess what? People that eat a lot of sugar and carbs are going to end up revving up that pathway and having a lot of erythritol in their blood. And so they said, oh, these people had heart attacks and they have high levels of erythritol. We better be worried about that the erythritol is causing these heart attacks. What they didn't say, you know, what they haven't emphasized in the reporting of this research is that the body makes erythritol and it could simply all be coming from there. So despite all those, you know, limitations and kind of the weird conclusions that were maybe being drawn at that point, what they did next is they said, okay, there's this association, right, with the high erythritol and the heart attacks and stuff. So let's look at a couple other related things, possibly related things. And so they, they took eight humans, possibly related to some recent research with eight mice, I don't know. But um, they took these eight humans and they gave them erythritol to eat, and then they checked their blood and said that they had elevated levels of erythritol in their blood. No surprise there, you know, because you absorb some of the erythritol that you eat into your bloodstream. But then the other thing that they did was they took some blood in a basically like a test tube or a Petri dish, and they added erythritol to it. So imagine some, putting your blood in a Petri dish, dumping a little packet of erythritol on it, and then they found that the platelets were more reactive when they did that in vitro, meaning outside the body. Um, and then they, they put together these three things. There's this association, which might have nothing to do with eating erythritol, as, it, as I explained. Then there's the fact that if you eat erythritol, your erythritol level does increase. And then the idea that outside of the body, there's an increased platelet reactivity um, when you add erythritol. So if you stitch those three things together, you can maybe come up with this kind of Frankenstein of a research paper uh, to say erythritol might increase your risk of heart attacks. But is that actually reliable? Is that something you should actually hang your hat on? Should you actually change your behavior as a result of that? So it's maybe worth mentioning that uh, you think, you know, these researchers that did this, they probably know that this is very low quality research and it's not reliable. So why did they leak it to the press? Um, well, I don't know for sure, but there are a few possibilities, right? Maybe they have some kind of preconceived bias against erythritol and so maybe once they found like possible evidence of harm they're like okay let's leak this or maybe they just wanted to be famous you know because you get famous if you do research that's all over the news or maybe they actually had good motivations at heart i don't know i don't know any of the people involved but you got to think about human nature like why would you do that if you were in that situation but the result is all these scary headlines and regardless of what their motivation is a lot of people are now afraid of erythritol so it's worth noting that there was some other research out there before about erythritol, 
And some of it shows the opposite of what these people are saying. Uh, for example, there's a study that probably a little bit more compelling than this one that showed improved blood flow, improved, better blood flow in people who consumed erythritol. Actually, they studied both rats and humans, and they gave them erythritol and then looked at their blood flow, and they had better blood flow. Well, guess what? That's a little bit more of a real-world, real-life study. It was a pretty small sample. I think it was like 24 people or something. But it's actually more realistic that that might actually be telling us something important because they gave erythritol to people and then looked at what happened. Because in this other research, they really didn't do that at all other than saying, oh, their erythritol level goes up in the bloodstream. That's the only thing they did that's in the real world, kind of real life, um, showing what was going on. So kind of the overall takeaway from this research, what did we actually learn what, 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 and what should you do as a result? Well, the reality is it doesn't tell us much. It really doesn't tell us anything. I mean, it tells, it tells you some some little bits of data, but it doesn't tell you whether erythritol is actually harmful in your body. Because things that happen in a Petri dish don't necessarily apply to the human body. In many cases, there's countless examples of things where they can show it in a test tube, but it doesn't apply when you actually put it inside the body. And so, you know, should you actually stop using erythritol or, or what, you know, how harmful is it, et cetera, et cetera. Well, if you're using erythritol in a way that allows you to replace sugar and other harmful foods, then you're probably getting a net benefit, right? even if there is some theoretical harm to erythritol, which there may not be any, it might just be nonsense. Um, now, are you better off not using sweeteners at all? Probably, but that's easier said than done, right? If you have kind of a, a sugar addiction, for example, sometimes, sometimes people find it helpful to replace it with something, at least for a while, as a bridge. And so probably the net benefit of doing that is definitely worth it, even if you're consuming something that has a bunch of scary headlines like this. Um, so an interesting comparison is cholesterol. So back in the day, like the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, um, some researchers and scientists and government officials decided that, well, it looks like cholesterol seems to be harmful in the body, so we better tell people not to eat cholesterol, because then it might cause harm in the body. But eventually it was shown that there's really no connection between the cholesterol you eat and any harmful effects of cholesterol in your body. And even to this day, though, a lot of people still think they need to limit how much cholesterol they eat. So that was an example where they were using very low quality kind of research connections or what have you, and just kind of hypotheses and all this stuff, and came up with a, with a conclusion and a recommendation which has persisted for decades even though it's nonsense. And so with this erythritol, will, will that turn out to be something similar? Very, very possibly, very possibly. I, I don't know. Um, I mean, more research is needed to show if there's an actual connection, but like high quality randomized controlled trials is what you would want to do. Pers perspective research where you're like giving somebody erythritol and seeing what happens, kind of like that small study I talked about where it actually showed improved blood flow. Um, and so overall, the impact of these headlines is probably more harmful than helpful is kind of my takeaway because people are going to be throwing out their erythritol with the bathwater. <laughs> um, in other words, you know, they're throwing it all out, but what are they going to replace it with? Now, if you're just not going to use any sweeteners, okay, fine. But if you're going to replace it with sugar at any point in time, then it's probably a net harm, a net decrement. So one other thing I wanted to mention was, uh, I've mentioned this in another video recently, but there's uh, seven deadly sins of journalism. What's journalism and what, what, where does this all come from? So there's a blog post from a substack called Sensible Medicine, which has some different researchers and people who are really good at analyzing research. And they came up with these seven deadly sins of journalism, meaning when you know newspapers and stuff churn out nutrition headlines like eggs will kill you, eggs will save you, coffee will kill you, coffee will save you, um, blueberries cure cancer, all these different things, right? You see all these headlines um, that are based on low quality research and then, you know, they're just trying to get clicks. And so that's what journalism is. And this clearly falls into journalism, by the way. And I'm going to go through the seven deadly sins of journalism and show how they apply here briefly. So the first one is observational studies almost never prove causation. So this was not only an observational study with the first part of it where they were just looking at the blood levels of things. They weren't even, even looking at the actual question they were trying to answer. They didn't give people erythritol and then see what happened. They just looked at the blood of people who were having heart attacks. So it was even worse than observational research. Um, extrapolation and generalization. So of course they're kind of extrapolating not from the test tube to the human body, they're, ex they're, extrap they're generalizing from those eight people that they gave it to, to the whole human population in terms of like the blood levels. And then, you know, a bunch of other extrapolations. 
Um, number three is ignoring confounding selection bias and other epidemiological errors. So there's this huge elephant in the room, this huge confounder, which is the erythritol that they were measuring in the first part of the research was probably just from that pentose phosphate pathway and not erythritol that people ate. Very, 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 very likely that that's the, the vast majority of what they were finding in the bloodstream. Um, so that was the big fat confounder that they were ignoring, and then there, there are others as well. Um, the fourth deadly sin of journalism is neglecting plausibility. So how plausible is it that the erythritol is the cause of these heart attacks? Not very plausible. And that's because, you know, they're looking at these people when they have the heart attack, let's look at their blood. And it's, like I said, very likely it's simply coming from their own metabolism that erythritol is produced in their body. And so it's much more likely that that's where the bulk of that is coming from, as opposed to that they all ate a bunch of erythritol before their blood was tested. So, I mean, is, is it conceivable? Yeah, but it's a very low probability that that's really what's going on. Um, disclaim and pivot. If you read any of these news articles, you'll probably see a disclaimer or several disclaimers, but then they'll pivot back to the topic. They'll say like, oh, well, this is observational research and a test tube and it can't really show that that's really what's happening in the body. But don't forget, you know, erythritol may be harmful. And of course, if you just read the headline, you don't see any of those disclaimers, right? Um, and then sin number six is keep testing, report just once. So a bunch of different research has been done on erythritol. Not a lot of high quality research, but several different things. But they're just reporting the one that's very inflammatory and sensational um, to try to get your attention. And then number seven, being incurious. In other words, not being curious. So that's the final deadly sin of journalism. So if you're not curious, what do I mean by that? Well, when you look at this kind of observational research and say like, oh, they noticed an, a connection between erythritol and heart attacks and cardiovascular problems. Well, does that mean the erythritol caused the heart attacks? Maybe. But what else could be going on? What else could be going on? And that's where they're not being very curious. They're not really diving into that. And the most obvious glaring answer is it's probably just because they were eating a lot of sugar and carbs and it increased the erythritol produ production in their body. That the, seems like the most probable um, conclusion to draw from the research, actually. <laughs> so don't eat so, many, so much sugar and so many carbs, basically, um, would be kind of my takeaway based on that. So what am I going to do as a result of this new research? This new research, very low quality. Nothing. I'm literally not going to make any change to my behavior other than making this video as a result of this research because it doesn't really tell me anything except that it was kind of interesting to review the pentose phosphate pathway and to remember that you know your body actually makes erythritol. And I'm like, huh, that's kind of weird. But uh, otherwise, I don't really see any reason to change my behavior. Now, I'm, am I consuming a lot of erythritol on a daily basis? No, but I do from time to time if I have some sort of like low carb dessert thing, but, which is not an everyday occurrence, but sometimes. And I wouldn't really be worried about that. I don't think like, oh no, now I'm going to have a heart attack. Because it's very, very unlikely that there's a strong connection between those things. And there are much more harmful things that I could be doing, like eating a sugary dessert. <laughs> I would wager a lot of money that the sugary dessert is a lot more harmful than the erythritol sweetened dessert. So that's kind of the takeaway there. Uh, so those are my thoughts. Uh, if you want to learn more about nutrition and get some nutrition tips, I have a video playlist right here that goes over a bunch of things, a bunch of interesting tidbits about that. And if you want to learn about the benefits of intermittent fasting, which is a major topic I address on this channel, got a playlist for you right here. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you next time.